Uh, yeah. So hi, I'm Mike. Uh, I am the co-founder and CEO of the Duckbill Group, uh, also the uh, partner and wrangler of Corey Quinn, which most of that's a full time uh, job. That's a full time job. Uh, <laughs> most of you watching will will know that one more than you know me. Uh, essentially, I run the Duckbill Group. Uh, so uh, I've we've been around for about four and a half years, uh, working exclusively on AWS cost management. Uh, and it's been a wild ride. Uh, we don't pay a lot of attention to RIs and savings plans and like a lot of the common financial constructs. Like, yes, we could do those things and we understand them. But a lot of our work really comes in at the architectural level. Uh, we believe that your architectural choices are what really drive your cost, not, you know, idle resources and such. In addition to that, we help our clients with AWS contract negotiation. Uh, about half of our work is helping negotiate those contracts. Uh, to date, we're just over $4 billion in contract ne negotiated. So we've been doing quite a bit of those too. We're, we do all the things that the FinOps Foundation talks about. We do, we do all the things that FinOps is about. Uh, but we don't do them ourselves. Like we have a $6,000 a year AWS bill. And like, I just don't care about it. I, I never look at it. I don't, I don't care. It's immaterial money. My tagging practices are awful. Like <laughs> the cobbler's children have no shoes. Perfectly <laughs> describes duck bills, cost management practices. I have heard that and <laughs> said that probably three times in the last couple of days. <laughs> it's absolutely true. The reason for that is because we spend all of our effort working on our clients' bills instead. Uh, our clients uh, average about a million dollars a month. So the amount of effort that we can put into them compared to us, like, you know, we don't care about our own costs. Uh, so we, we work with our clients on uh, not really controlling costs, not always lowering costs. It's one of the things that we found is it's not necessarily about making the bill smaller. Often it's about having a better understanding of what's driving the bill. The, the CFO is going to hit you with a stick if your bill goes, uh, if your bill is behaving in an erratic way. Like, that's the problem. If your bill is $5 million one month, $3 million the next month, $10 million the month after, like, that's a problem. And even if the numbers are consistently lower, that's still a problem. What really matters is, like, are we spending the money in the places we should be spending the money? And the size of the bill is irrelevant to that point. Uh, and do we understand why we're spending it? Do we understand what's driving those costs and that that is a good thing for us? So a lot of our work is really in helping our clients understand uh, what's driving their cost and how they can have a better understanding of that and better influence their cost. Uh, some clients spend vastly more money after we're done and are happy to do it because they have a better understanding of why they're doing it. But a lot of the work that we do is about, at some level, reducing cost, which we believe is all about like optimizing architecture decisions. I like that approach. In are you seeing your customers, their rank of maturity going from like a crawl, a walk, a run within the FinOps culture or a variation of them? What does it look like from an outside perspective? You know, it really varies. Um, I will say that there, are, in a very large company, it's you can never say this company is mature. Uh, what you see instead is there are pockets of maturity. What I see most often is there is a central FinOps function, and then there are engineering teams that are doing their own cost management practices to some degree in conjunction with something the central team is providing. Uh, in a run, right? They're not in a run long or they're a small amount of a run while they're do yeah. implementing variation things of the culture throughout their journey. And that if you're not constantly changing your maturity level from run to crawl to walk, whatever it is, then I think you're not always improving or there's new things not happening and you're not doing it right. So you make a really great point there because when people think about maturity levels, like having a maturity level model to begin with is I think sort of broken because let's say that I'm a small company today and like I have a $6,000 a month bill. Uh, today I have very low maturity. If I had no money 
then I would probably have very high maturity on this because I'd be paying a lot of attention to it. So at some point, I'm going to improve my maturity of how I manage my bill. Let's say that I then go raise $40 million, and now I'm hiring a whole bunch of new engineers to build this product. What do you think my maturity is going to be? I'm not going to suddenly improve on that. I'm actually going to regress. And that's fine. Like, there's no problem with that. But I think it's really misguided to think that as a company grows, their maturity level also grows linearly. Like, it it's, goes up. It should not go up. It changes over time. And that's fine. And I think the more important thing is to be aware of when it's changing and why it's changing. Mike, I just asked you about some of the biggest mistakes immature make. But I want to flip that. Do you see even mature FinOps teams make mistakes? And what are they? I do. Man, that is a great question. Uh, the biggest mistake that I see mature FinOps teams make is that they, they can often fall into a, a command and control structure, a, a, a sort of a gatekeeping posture with engineering teams. And that's, that's pretty bad. You end up in this situation where uh, engineering wants to do something and now FinOps is sort of a, they have to do a review before engineering can make the decision. Wrong direction. Uh, finance has never been the gatekeeper to doing some, to doing engineering work. Like it, they intentionally are not. For FinOps to do so, bad idea. Even security should not be a gatekeeper to engineering doing their job. Uh, all of these roles are supporting roles to getting the product shipped. So you have to you have to not have a gatekeeping posture, uh, which is really hard to do because a lot of teams believe that a lot of FinOps teams uh, can fall into this mistaken belief that their job is to control the cost, and it's not. Their job is to enable engineering to make better decisions. Azure and GCP, Oracle, I, Alibaba, I have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> uh, Neither do I. <laughs> yeah. So, so staying, on, staying on top of the, the pace of changes coming from AWS uh, is always hard. Uh, shout out to last week in AWS. Uh, but I think the, the really hard part there is that we still see teams not adopting things like S3 intelligent tiering. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. That came out like, what, 2020, 2021? Like, it's years old at this point. What the heck? Like, why is no one adopting it? And it's that they don't know. And I think one of the hardest parts is you, you can't shame an engineering team for not knowing. Uh, you, have to, you have to think, like, why, why don't they know? Well, because they have a bajillion other things they're thinking about. So... We see some struggles with education, uh, just like here are the options you have. Um, even down to things like, hey, you have this, this application that by how it's designed could be a great candidate for Lambda, but the team has no experience with Lambda, so they've never considered Lambda. Uh, and the organization doesn't have a lot of other Lambda usage, so no one's willing to be the first one to try it. And it's like, well, that sucks. How do you get through that? And at some point, someone has to say like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try it. I'm going to push to make that happen. But someone's got to tell them that's okay. Someone's got to tell them it was an option to begin with. So a lot, a lot of the education is just a really big challenge. And this becomes a, a massive challenge when you're working with very large organizations. Mike, as we wrap things up, who are some of the most influential practitioners in FinOps today? Well, John, you know I'm going to say you, just to pander. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm touched, you, man. You you know, you know one one of the, one of the things that I I will give a shout out to all the people who were not public. Uh, we work with some of some of the most amazing people at our clients who are just incredibly good at what they do. And they're not public for various reasons. Uh, many of them work in organizations where they aren't allowed to be public, but they're doing amazing work. So I know a lot of them follow this channel. A lot of them will probably see this video. So I will actually say shout out to all the people doing amazing work who aren't public.